It is now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Tim McCarthy. Tim is a lecturer on history and literature at Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences and an adjunct lecturer on public policy here at the Kennedy School. He's also the director of Sexuality, Gender, and Human Rights Program at our Carr Center for Human Rights. He's also a historian of politics and social movements and, a, and an award-winning scholar, teacher, and public servant. His courses, American Protest Literature from Tom Paine to Tupac, Stories of Slavery and Freedom, and the Arts of Communication here at the Kennedy School are consistently among the most popular and highly rated at Harvard. He is also the author of four books. His fifth book, Stonewall's Children, A Modern Story of Liberation, Loss, and Love, will be published next spring. In addition to his writing and teaching, Dr. McCarthy has devoted his life to public service and social justice, particularly around issues of racial, sexual, socioeconomic justice, educational equity, peace, and human rights. As founding director of Harvard's Alternative Spring Break Church Rebuilding Program, he has spent the last 15 years organizing groups of undergraduates to help rebuild African American churches that have been destroyed in arson attacks. In honor of this work, Dr. McCarthy has received the 2007 Humble Servant Award from the National Coalition of Burned Churches and the 2010 Advocate Award from the Phillips Brooks House Association. These are among the, a lengthy list of public service and teaching excellence awards that Professor Martin McCarthy has received. I have tremendous respect for his leadership, his knowledge, his wisdom, and his courage. Uh, but I think I'm most grateful for his character and his humanity. It is my great pleasure to introduce to you Professor Tim McCarthy. for that introduction and welcome all of you to the Kennedy School. It's great to see all of you here. I'm not a morning person at all. I've yet to have some coffee so I'm hoping that the energy in the room will sustain me uh, through these uh, short remarks here this morning. Uh, truth be told, I rarely get asked to speak in the Kennedy School forum. This is a fancy place. And as you can probably tell, if you haven't heard already, I'm hardly the fanciest member of the faculty. Uh, that was a work of fiction that Melody Jackson just uh, shared with, with all of you. Uh, but I do share at least one thing in common with all of my distinguished colleagues here at the Kennedy School, and we get to teach all of you, which is a great treasure for all of us who are lucky enough to be on the faculty here. When I ask people about my, uh, when people ask me about my Kennedy School students, I always say the same thing, that it is a great privilege and pleasure to teach a group of people who share a common set of values, driven by a fierce ethic of public service and a genuine desire to change the world. Here, these are not outworn cliches. They are moral commitments. Speaking of which, Marion Wright Edelman, one of my heroines, the great civil rights leader and the founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund, has said that service is the price we pay for living. My hero, the writer James Baldwin, put it another way, but had something similar in mind when he said that we must earn our death by confronting the conundrum of life. He goes on to say that one is responsible to life. It is the small beacon in that terrifying darkness from which we come and to which we shall return. One must negotiate this passage as nobly as possible for the sake of those who come after us. I love this idea, this idea of repaying the blessing of our precious time on this planet by giving as generously as we can of ourselves while we're here and working to leave the world a better place when we leave it. All of you have already begun to do that. Being here today is one manifestation of that commitment. If you were selfish, insensitive, uncaring people, you wouldn't be here. Do not keep us wrong. 
24 years ago, nearly a half a century ago, alas, I too was a new student at Harvard, at Harvard College. And like you, I was fired up and ready to go, but I didn't quite know exactly where to put all of that energy. And I have a lot of energy, less now than I did 24 years ago, but I try my best to muster that energy. It takes more caffeine uh, these days. Though it seems now a lifetime ago in some ways, the world at that time was experiencing a similarly rough kind of turbulence. The imposing tanks in Tiananmen Square were met by the protests of a people passionate about democracy. The Cold War was ending and the wall in Berlin was crumbling. AIDS, a great domestic scourge during the, non during the 80s, was quickly becoming a global epidemic even as humanitarian aid was slow to become a moral imperative. And as the vicious apartheid regime in South Africa was staging its last stand, Nelson Mandela, who was called a terrorist when I entered college, and who is now one of the great heroes of our age, walked out of prison and was elected to the presidency of his nation. Here in the United States, Americans struggled with the aftershocks of a decade of unbridled deregulation, corporate greed, growing economic and social inequalities, wars in other lands, and misplaced government spending. Too much on prisons and missiles, too little on things like health care and education. Sound familiar? Our politics were harsh, our politics often harmful. But amidst, these, amidst this reality, we, many of us, could see glimpses of progress and possibility. After all, optimism, the stubborn willingness and capacity to see a better way forward, is the lifeblood of any meaningful social change. It was in this context that I first understood public service as a way of life, as a calling, an individual's moral duty to a world crying out for change. On the very first, one of the very first things I did, one of the very best things I did when I came onto campus in the fall of 1989, was to do a walking tour of the city. And it was a walking tour that was led by students who were returning to campus. It was part of the first year urban program, which was a uh, one week public service and social justice program that they call thought at Harvard, often misinterpreted for something far more, um, um, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> and this was an intensive week where we got to understand the community and we got to do things that were in service to the community. But the first day we took a walking tour of the city. We took the T and the red line up to Alewife, which is the last stop the outbound train here. We walked through Fresh Pond and North Cambridge to Mass Ave. The only street in this area that runs all the way through from the suburbs of Cambridge through the suburbs of Boston. And we walked all day, morning to night, from the Arlington Town Line through Porter Square and Harvard Square and Central Square, across the Charles River, into Back Bay, through uh, the South End, to Roxbury Crossing, and ultimately to Dorchester, the city's largest and most diverse neighborhood. Along the way, we learned to stop and smell the roses, to take in the local history, to eat local food, to talk to local folks. We shared stories, we took some pictures, and we got to know each other too. At the end of the journey, we took the tea back to Harvard Square. At once exhausted and exhilarated, a feeling I suspect many of you will feel at the end of your work today. We spent the rest of the week doing service projects in and around Cambridge and Boston. In many ways, I think that HKS serves, which was, I like to call the spiritual gift that former Dean of Students Chris Fortunato, my good friend, gave to this school, embodies that very same spirit. And it's nice to see, after all these years, that the beat does indeed go on. That walking tour of the city nearly a quarter century ago did two crucial things for me. First, it introduced me to my home a place that I have called my home for 17 years now. But second, it inspired in me a new commitment 
to serve it, to be of use to my neighbors in some meaningful way. Soon thereafter, I began volunteering through Head Start. I began volunteering at the homeless, the Harvard Square homeless shelter and tutoring at a local elementary school. Over time, I attended more community meetings and civil uh, city council hearings and church services and campaign rallies and public marches and protests. I taught Head Start, I directed youth programs, and played a lot of pickup basketball. At first, I suppose I was motivated by an earnest desire to give back, to mediate against the privileges that I had as a Harvard student. And make no mistake, by virtue of being a Harvard student, you are all now privileged, though I hope never entitled. When we volunteered our time each week to those who did not have the same access and opportunities that I had had growing up and that I would continue to have as a student here and now a faculty member. But something funny happened along the way in all of this work. As my service commitment deepened, my volunteer hours expanded, I began to realize that I was not just someone who could serve this community, I was a member of this community. I was, in other words, a neighbor. I was not detached from it or just in service to it, I was part of it, and therefore I was responsible and needed to be held accountable for its collective well-being. In other words, I like to call this the process by which I developed a local sense of justice and solidarity. Having been raised in a progressive working class Catholic household, this idea of being your brother's keeper, your sister's keeper, your neighbor's keeper, of treating and loving your neighbors as you would like to be treated and loved yourself, was in some ways second nature to me, thanks to my parents and grandparents and the folks who raised me. But as I've learned over the years, there's a difference between talking the talk and walking the walk. And there's a relationship between those two things. Ultimately, our value and impact as human beings and global citizens will be measured by how closely the actions we take match the words that we speak. And we can start as a new community right here and right now. Let me be frank with you for a second. One of the things that sometimes drives me nuts about Harvard is that far too many people at Harvard treat this place as a temporary rest stop a brief way of pausing on the way to something bigger and better. That this is a storied institution, or as some people like to call it, a brand. I hate that brand. Somehow separate from the vibrant and complex community that surrounds us. It's a place we come to network. I was having dinner at Daedalus last night, and I saw some of you networking last night. <laughs> My husband said to me, are you going to go over and say hi? I said, I'll say hi tomorrow. It's my last day of summer and I want to have dinner with you. Uh, it's a place we come to network with or without drinks. And it's also sometimes a place where we come and we think we're going to get credentialed. We're going to get that degree and that's going to get us a better job and so forth. But ironically, I believe this kind of perspective of branding and credentialing and networking is an unmistakably self-centered way of living one that actually gets in the way of living a life of service and justice. It positions us more as tourists than as neighbors, more as social climbers rather than history makers. And it often blinds us to the problems, challenges, and opportunities in our midst. Don't get me wrong, I've read lots of your essays and applications and had many conversations with a lot of you, I am impressed with the work that so many of you do and will continue to do here and all the way across the world. But I also think that while you're here, you must be more mindful of what this community needs. You see, for every fancy restaurant in Harvard Square, there is a person desperately in need of food. For every PhD candidate at Harvard, there is at least one public school student who needs a tutor. For every faculty member with a summer home, 
I am not one of those people. <laughs> there is a family who can't afford its rent or has to live on the streets. For every international student in this audience with a visa, there is an undocumented worker living in the shadows. For every theoretical conversation we have here about civilian casualties and collateral damage, there are real teenage victims of gang and gun violence and veterans returning home from wars who are struggling with the visible and invisible wounds of war. And for every seminar we offer on leadership and power, and there is no shortage of them, there is a person in this world who has been screwed by a powerful leader, some of whom have been trained here. I want to be truthful with you all as we begin our journey. The environmental movement has long embraced the mantra, think globally, act locally. And we would do well, I think, to adopt this ethos wherever we live, whether it's here or anywhere else in the world. But for the time being, for a year or two, in my case, maybe more, this is your home. Let me tell you a story, a short story, about how uh, acting locally can change your life. I met Malcolm at a, a teaching head start in one of the local elementary schools, the main elementary school here in Cambridge. Uh, it's not unlike some of the schools that, that some of you will be working in today. It's just a mile or so down the street here from Harvard, but it's across the street from the largest housing project in Cambridge. Uh, one day, the first day I was there, Malcolm was in punishment, uh, and he, uh, he didn't like me very much, uh, because I was assigned to make sure that he was behaving in timeout. Not a good start with a four-year-old kid. And I became the adult who was the punisher. And Malcolm has to laugh about that. But he was drawing a picture of, uh, of, a, of an apple, and an apple tree, and this little girl came in, and, and she says, that's a heart, Malcolm, that's a heart. And he looks at her, and he was like, no, 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 that's an apple. This is a, it's in a tree, it's an apple tree. And we had this very intense conversation about whether this was a heart or an apple. And of course, this little girl thought it was a heart because she thought Malcolm was cute. And she said, it's a heart because you love me. And, and which I thought was totally freaking adorable. And, and, and Malcolm, for the first time, he hadn't talked to me really. He was not happy with me. The first time he, he looks at me as if I'm his man. I'm no longer the punisher. I'm going to co-sign on the apple tree. <laughs> and he says, isn't this an apple? And I said, I think it looks like a heart. <laughs> So fast forward a couple weeks later, Malcolm and I made up and he forgave me for, for misinterpreting his artistic creation. And so he was drawing another painting with crayons after school and I was sitting there coloring with him and he was drawing a picture, drew a table and he drew a picture of his mother and of his sister and of himself and of his father. And then he looks up at me and says, will you be my brother? I have a mother and a father and a sister, I'm missing a brother. And I said, I mean, what do you say, right? A four-year-old asked if his brother. I'm like, no, I'd rather, you know, be drawn an apple tree. So I'm like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I'm totally on board with being your brother. No, I mean, no idea what that meant. I had been contemplating getting involved in the Big Brother, Big Sister program, but I had not made any commitment. Uh, and Malcolm said, okay, good. And he picks up, he puts down the brown crayon, because Malcolm's an a, a African-American kid. He picks up, he looks at the crayon box, <laughs> and he picks up a purple crayon and he draws it. <laughs> so we joke now that my nickname is Barney. <laughs> Malcolm and I spent three more years together as brothers uh, here in Cambridge while I was a student here. And we did lots of things together, all the stuff that you would imagine you would do together. Uh, and when I left here uh, after those three years, saying goodbye to him, moving to New York for graduate school, moving so far away where I had to show him a map of New York because he had never been outside of Boston and Cambridge, was one of the hardest days of my life. Four years later, I got one of the hardest phone calls of my life when Malcolm's mother called me crying in New York from Cambridge and said, I need you to come home, she said. The family had sort of fallen apart uh, Dad had left the scene, Mom was struggling trying to figure out how to work two or three jobs, uh, and Malcolm was about to sort of go through what she called the changes, starting to come of age as a young man. 
and she was worried that he wasn't going to have the support that he needed and there was a lot of temptation in school and in the community and so she asked me if I would move back here and help her raise him. I had just finished my graduate orals. I was writing my dissertation prospectus. I had presented conference papers and won my first fellowship. I was on the make. And I had to figure out, what do I do? Do I pursue this path and get this dissertation and become a fancy historian and go be a department chair someday, somewhere? Or do I go back and help her raise this boy who I was madly in love with? And so I decided to move back here, home, to raise him. It was terrible timing. But sometimes other people's realities get in the way of your dreams. And so I came back and I raised him. And he lived with me for his time in high school. He went to Ringin Latin. One day after school, I felt pretty good about that decision ultimately, even though my dissertation took a while to write. But I came back here and I was struggling at that time. Our relationship changed because I was no longer the fun brother who played basketball and went to movies. I was now the father figure who made sure that he was home on time and scolded him and punished him and made sure that he got his homework done and was walking a straight line and doing sports and committing to things and being a good person in the world. And that was a relationship that he didn't like very much. He preferred the basketballs and the movies and the fun. And so did I, frankly. But there was another change that was going on during this time, my own struggle with my sexuality. And I had denied this for a long time because I didn't, it was hard enough to be the white guy raising a black kid. It was a little bit even more difficult trying to be the gay white guy raising the black kid who was standing at your house. And so I kept all of that in the closet and figured out I'll come out later once he's in college or something. But one day after school, he was a sophomore. And he had, there was a, uh, a, an assembly at his school, where the school gathered together and this guy spoke. And he was a civil rights activist, and he was evidently a big guy with a booming voice, reminded Malcolm of me. And then during the course of the presentation about civil rights, he, this guy came out, and he said, I'm gay. And he talked about the intersections of social justice and civil rights and so forth. And Malcolm, at 15, was sort of compelled by this. So he came home thinking about, oh, this guy sounds a lot like Tim, looks a lot like Tim. And in Malcolm's mind, he told me later on, the connection that he had made was, here's this gay white guy, big guy, booming voice, civil rights. Maybe that's why Tim loves black people. <laughs> He's 15, he made that connection. I was gay, I love black people. I didn't know what that connection was, but that was in his mind. He came home that night, and he asked me if I'm gay. And I said no. And I experienced this anxiety and panic. I still feel it in me when I write tell the story. And then he asked me again, Tim, are you gay? And I got mad at him. And I said, no, Malcolm, I'm not gay. I don't know where you're getting this from. And he just sat back in his chair and folded his arms and said, Tim, it's an easy question. If you asked me if I'm black, I'd say yes. <laughs> Over the years, a lot of people have given me a lot of credit for making the decision to come back and raise him, and some people have even said that I helped to save his life, which is not true. That's not the story. But he did definitely save my life. If it were not for Malcolm, a little boy drawing the apple tree that looked like a heart, I would not be standing here in front of you today. On Memorial Day weekend two years ago, Malcolm stood by my side as my best man when I married my husband right here on campus. And next week, his daughter, my beautiful, precious niece, Malia, will attend her first day of school here and home. The beat goes on indeed. The moral of this story, you haven't figured it out, is that acting locally, being a good neighbor, serving others meaningfully, in the place you call home, becoming each other's keepers, can touch your life and can impact many lives. And in my case, it can save your life. Today is a start. It's a good start. The only place to start. And it's only the beginning of what I hope and anticipate will be a lifetime of service. And so let me once again welcome each and every one of you, not just to Harvard, enough people doing that, but to Cambridge, 
and to Boston. This community is a great place to live and to learn, to grow and to give back, to search your soul and strive to become a better citizen by being a good neighbor. I wish all of these things for you. If you have all of these things, it can be a rich and meaningful life. And for as long as you choose to make this your home, may this be so. But enough from me. Let's get to work.